Yep. There we go. So this is the uh, fly that I'm going to tie for you today, and it will be short and sweet. It's a, a fairly simple fly. It's called a tom thumb. And it's in the sequence of flies that I've been tying for you guys lately, which are old flies. So this one's been around for a long time. I got the, uh, I got the pattern information out of uh, Phil Rowley's book, Flies Patterns for Still Waters. And it's right at the very back. Um, so he, he gives the detailed instruction and he gives a, a little bit of history. So this, this fly goes back to the 1940s. Uh, this guy, this guy, back to the 1940s. And he gives a, a reasonably good description of how to tie it. The key with, with this pattern is uh, getting the uh, getting the tail and the front length of, of deer hair that sticks out about the right length. That's one key. And, it's, and part of that key is don't put too much deer hair on. <laughs> Keep the quantity of deer hair you're using uh, small. So that's, that's the one that I tied, one of the better ones I tied. Uh, you don't have to use regular deer hair. You can uh, adapt. You can use yellow. So that's a yellow, yellow one. And I even tied one here that's got some green deer hair. So there's, there's a green one. Now, what I found is if you're going to use the colored ones, the patches that I was able to get lately, the deer hair is kind of short compared to what you want. So I ended up tying those ones on uh, size 10s or 12s because the, the deer hair is not long enough to tie, uh, tie, tie the, the bigger hook. I'm tying this on a size 8 so that it's a little easier for you guys to see what's going on. Um, but you can see the difference between the length of deer hair. This is the patch that I got the other day that's yellow because I didn't have any yellow deer hair. And this is the stuff that I've been using. So look at the difference in, in length of deer hair. Ma makes, a, makes a big difference in terms of how easy it is to tie this thing on larger hook sizes. So I'm using the, the longer deer hair. It's not the deer belly hair. It's from somewhere else on the, the guy. So um, the hook is, uh, I've got a, a dry fly hook size eight. Uh, and that gives a reasonable shank length uh, to make it and, and make it easier for you guys to see. I've debarbed it and put it in the vise. Make sure it's good and secure. And I'm going to use uh, six aught thread or eight aught actually. This was right. This is eight aught thread. You can use six aught on the bigger ones, uh, but. If you get down to the smaller ones, it's a little easier to use ADOT. I'm going to start right behind the eye of the hook, and then I will wrap the entire hook shank with thread. And part of the reason for that is you don't want the deer hair when you're tying it on to spin around the hook. And the way, the way to stop it from spinning is to make sure that the thread covers the shank of the hook. That helps keep it on top of the hook. Now, Take that thread right back to the bend and then bring my thread all the way up to the front. And I'm going to leave it about eye, one to two eyelid, eye widths behind the eye of the hook. And another way of making sure things don't spin on this first batch of deer hair is I've got a little bit of super glue, just a touch of super glue, just to coat the thread and let it tack up before I stick my fingers on it. Tying these things is a little noisy because I'm going to stack the deer hair. So here's my patch of deer hair. And I read in the, in the, in the Phil's book, he says, get a group of deer hair that's about the size of a pipe cleaner. Do you know anybody who sells pipe cleaners anymore? I don't. 
No, you can't buy them. I don't know. I, uh, yeah. I haven't seen anyone smoke a pipe in years. Yeah, you might be able to go into those tobacco shops and find somebody who sells pipe tobacco and, and the pipe cleaners. But anyway, I'm, I'm going to suggest that we, we try to use the hook to... Uh, oh, one of, the, one of the key things is you've got to get all the fuzz out of the deer hair. So I'm holding it by the tips and I have a, a fine tooth comb and I'm going to just run the comb through it and get all the fuzz out. So one of the tools you need to do these deer hair flies is a, a nice fine tooth comb. So take all that and I'm going to look, bring this up to the fly and you can see how much I'm using. It's about half of a gap width of, of hair and that's about the right amount. I have a hair stacker. Here's my hair stacker and it's one of the big ones. So it, deer hair, it's a little easier to stack in these kind of sizes if you have a bigger stacker. Now put the deer hair into the stacker and I'm gonna whack it a few times. Here you, you hear it. I'm gonna whack it a few times. And the purpose of that is to get all of the tips together. So when I take it out, I take it out, I always have the deer hair stacker pointing down slightly so that the tips stick out the bottom. And I'll grab them there. And inevitably you end up with a couple of ones that, that don't line up. And so I'm just gonna pull those free so that it's nice and even stacked. I need to measure this up as to where I'm gonna tie it onto the hook chain. That's another couple of longers sticking up there. And what I want is I want the tail to be about a gap, way, gap width behind the bend of the hook. So that's about where you want the tail. That silly little black one, I can't see where it is. It's, there we go, get that guy out. I want this nice and nice and even at the back. Get out of there. Come on. There. All right. So I'm going to measure that. And I will hold it in my left hand, right where the thread is hanging. And trim it off nice and square just past the end of my fingers. And you see I've got it kind of squished so that it's it's uh, in a it's not round, it's kind of flat. I'll hold that right where the thread is on top of the hook. And I'll make my first wrap on top of that so that it gets the end of the deer hair and traps it down right by the eye. At this point, I will hold the deer hair up above the shank and I will not use a lot of pressure, but I wanna use just enough to pull the deer hair down onto the shank. And as I get towards the end, I'm going to ease up on the pressure a little bit so that it doesn't flare the deer hair too much right at the bend. And I'll do it right to the bend. I'll leave my thread there for a sec. Got one mallard up here, piece of hair here that's sticking out. Quit it. There we go. All right. And I'm going to write wrap it down a little harder, all the way up to where I tied, tied it in. So that's the first bit at the back. And I might have got that tail just a hair long, but that's okay, it's not too bad. I'm gonna get, a, again, a simple repeat of approximately the same size of clump of deer hair. I'm trim it off as long as I can on the because this is where you need the longer part of the hair. And I'll get a couple of bits out of there. And that might that might be a little a little bit too much. So I'm gonna just pull a few strands off to get it down to a manageable clump size. So that's about the same size of clump of deer hair as what I had for the tail. Once again, hold them by the tips and uh, Use your comb to uh, pull all the uh, fuzz out. 
I ha it pays to have a, a, a waste uh, container just right under your vise so that this doesn't end up on the floor. Otherwise, you've got to get the vacuum. So there's my clump of deer hair I'm going to work, but I need to stack it again. So back in the hair stacker. And back it a bit. I'm doing that on my knee. There's, there's my clump of deer hair with the tips stacked up nice. Now this is the key is, is you don't want too much length sticking out the front of the fly this from this half so that I need to I'm going to measure from where the thread is now hanging to where the end of the tail is maybe just a little shy of that and grab it with my left hand and pull that back to where I tied the tail in and grab it just in front of the where the thread's hanging with my right hand, slide my left hand up and grab that whole bunch. So now I've got measured basically from here, you're going to have the shank plus the tail plus another length of tail. Is That's the key length that you want. Grab that with my left hand again, right where the thread was hanging and cut it off nice and square right there, right there. I'll do the same thing. I'll hold it right down where the thread is hanging and cinch the end of the deer hair down on top of the, the hook. And we'll do the same thing here. I'm going to keep it up as I wrap down. And I'm not going to squish this one too hard. One of the things you want this fly to do is float reasonably well. So I'm not going to really compress that deer hair a whole lot. I will wrap over top of it right back to where the thread last thread wrap was when I put the tail part on. And then I'll bring my thread all the way forward to just in front of the eye. Pull the, the deer hair that I just tied on, that whole batch, over the top, right on top of that body. And right where my thread is hanging, I will make sure this whole clump of deer hair is on top of the hook. And I'll do a bit of a loose wrap between my fingers to pull it down on top of the hook and put a little pressure with my index finger to keep it from wrapping around the hook. And I'll do another couple of wraps in there. And the second time or third time, I'll tighten it up a little bit. Then we pull up the clump of deer hair in the front and we wrap right between the where the deer hair is tied in and the eye of the hook. Just a teeny head. What I want that to do is hold the deer hair at the front so that it sticks up above the hook shank a little. Now the whip finish, and this is kind of a two-hand operation here. I will grab the whip finisher and then I'll use my fingers to pull that deer hair out of the way and do a quick whip finish. And being the belt and suspenders guy, I will do it again. Hold my fingers, hold that deer hair out of the way while I do the whip finish. And then like that. And then I can pull this deer hair back in where it belongs. Now, I don't, as, as you can see, one of the things that happens quite often is uh, you get a few stray bits of deer hair that, that don't behave themselves and they get a little long. So I get a pair of tweezers and I'll get in here and I will just pluck out the stuff that I don't like. And every time I grab it, grab the, the, the strand that I want, I just bend it back against where the thread ties it in. There's a couple of bits there that I want out. There's a couple of there. And one more. And that just tidies it up a little bit. Got a couple at the back I think I should get to. Just tidy though. The ones that are kind of sticking out, 
at the bottom. So there, there we have it. That is your friendly neighborhood, Tom Thumb. Thank you. That <clears throat> I've tried it a number of times and I've never been able to get a decent one. And uh, so seeing you do it gives me a clue how to go do it myself. Thank you. Yeah, yeah the, the, trick is, the trick is literally is the getting the, the measurements right and, and tying the deer, get, holding that deer hair and trimming it close to your fingers and keeping just the little bit that sticks out where the thread is that allows you to tie it in place so that the length is in the right spot. Uh, and, and holding the, the deer hair up off of the shank as you wrap down, keeps it from wrapping around the shank of the hook. So those, those are the keys that I found to make this thing work fairly straightforward. And it, it's fast enough you can tie a whole whack of them in a short time. When I immigrated to uh, Canada in the 60s uh, to Nelson, I went into the sporting goods store and I said, what fly should I use? And this was the one he told me to use. And uh, at that time, it was behind a bobber on a spinning rod. And <laughs> so I caught my first fish almost on flies with this fly. Yeah, uh, that's great. Yeah, it's it's been around for a while. And it's it's you can use it anywhere. I, I think it, it's not like it's uh, a particularly for one specific application. I, I, you know, I think you can use it as a dry fly. Uh, you can make it like a popper. You can strip it like a popper. Uh, it just creates a disturbance on the surface that uh, for some, and I think it, 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 I don't know what it imitates other than perhaps a beetle. I've even used it for ants fishing for sedges. And yeah, uh, yeah, a, a traveler that in fast on a sedge fish. Yeah, yeah, on a on a uh, tr like a traveling sedge. Yeah, yeah. So there you go. So that was quick and dirty for me, Florin. You're you you're on. Mine is quick and dirty too, so we'll be done early today. So we have easy ties. So this is this um, this llama leech that was the uh, created by one of the local guys here, Dennis Southwick, in the uh, Northern Lights fly tires. And here are some some versions I tried, varying the color of the bead, and some versions where. I also varied the color of the main material. So these are the uh, these are the various these are the various possibilities. This is the Ooh. basic <clears throat> the basic tie. So called the let's call this the original. Um, and I thought that you know using a jig hook and the fluorescent bead might be uh, might be something worth trying. And this was. Another tie where I used a slightly different color of uh, llama dubbing and I put a bit of a red tag thread on the bend of the hook, fluorescent bead and jig hook. So you can imagine variations. Another variation of which I haven't tied any samples now is to use um, a wet fly hackle just behind the bead like, um, like a partridge yeah. uh, feather. So that would be another uh, another trick to try. Now the hook size for this uh, is typically a size twelve, and I don't see any reason why not try you know slightly bigger, slightly smaller. But I'm going to stick to the twelve today. And Dennis likes to tie his uh, llama leeches on this short shank uh, wet fly hook by Daiichi, the, the 1510. I found that a very similar hook to that one that is just a shade bigger and has heavier wire is the TMCO 2457, also in size 12, just a little bit bigger. And so between these two hooks, you can find equivalents that will cover kind of a similar range. And here's a 
here's a challenge test, you know, which ones are the Daiichi hooks and which ones are the, uh, the TM codes. You know, I think these are the, I think these are the TM codes. You can see the thick, slightly thicker wire and the bend. And down here, this one is the, uh, this is the Daiichi. And I'm also using two kinds of beads here. The, the main idea is to use a red bead. And here's the, uh, the original recipe calls for 764th um, red tungsten bead. So these are the regular painted beads. And now more recently, I found these tungsten metallic beads that I thought looked kind of spiffy. So I wanted to try to tie a few of these things with the, with the metallic beads. As you've seen, these these ones came from uh, from Canadian Llama. Uh, these other ones, I think, this came from uh, from Trout Bum. Okay, this guy has pretty good prices, and when the stuff is in stock, it's it's pretty good. Okay, so now for the main tie. So I'm going to grab one of the one of the prepared hooks. I usually prepare a bunch of hooks and just sit down and sit down and tie. So I'm going to take one of the prepared hooks and put it in the vise. Now for thread, if you want the thread to blend in, then use some red thread. And I find that for these red beads, the uh, standard uni thread six odd would, would work quite well. So you can see here, I'm going actually with the with the TMCO hook. So just put down a, a bed of thread here. And go to where the bend of the hook is, as it were. Now that's a... Uh, sometimes a difficult thing to to gauge but basically the all these instructions that say go to the bend of the hook if it's not clear where that bend may be such as in a continuous bend hook like this it's always a, a good idea to think of where the barb was before you crushed it okay uh, if you have a barbless hook then you have to use your imagination and think of where the barb might have been if the hook had a barb Right, so you can have a lot of fun with that. Now, the main material for this is this llama fiber, which comes, I have this, it's just essentially it's like a skein, as you can see. Um, and the nature of the fiber, if you're, if you don't happen to, to have a chunk of llama, uh, llama hair sitting nearby, <clears throat> dyed in the right color. I bought this years ago. I think Dennis was uh, was selling this. I don't know if it was him or him and a partner that were doing this. I have no idea. But I have two colors. I have this um, this green. It's kind of like an olive olive green, and there is a little bit of variation here in the color. So I'm thinking, you know, when I look at this, uh, some of the semi seal blends come pretty close to this and they also have fairly long fibers. So I suspect that might work out well as a substitute. The other color I have, they labeled it a golden stone. So it's kind of a golden olive, you know, and I think this would make also a nice, a nice color to, to tie with. And that's why I tried to tie a few, a few samples with this color as well. Okay. So that's the, the hardest part, I guess, is to, to procure the materials. Now for the for the fly itself. So what you want to do is you want to take some of this fiber and not too much of it. Sorry for saying that, but it's just there's no better way of, of putting it. Now, this is a soft material. It's not quite as, you know, it doesn't quite compress to nothing like marabou does, but it's still quite, quite soft. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to pull some of these fibers here at the end to get to some kind of a taper. Because I like, Dennis just takes the scissors and cuts it straight 
at the back end. I, I like to tie this a bit with a bit of a taper maybe. Um, and again, you can do just like with Marabou, you know, you can just hold the, hold the fibers in your hand and, and pull, you know, to trim it to shape. Now, don't throw away the stuff that you pulled off. Just keep this on the, on the base of the vise because I'm going to use everything. Okay. So the first step is I'm going to cut myself a little piece here and cut here and tie it on as, as a tail. And you can vary here. It's a bit of a question of taste. Do you like shorter tails? Do you like longer tails? I'm going to go to about shank length. So a few thread wraps, then catch it all and go to the front and then come back to have this nicely secured. Okay. If some of the fibers stick out, don't worry about it because we're going to cover this now with dubbing. Now use any hair that's still lying around that you pulled out from trimming the first piece for the tail to shape and just dub that on your thread or pull more from the from the main main clump for dubbing purposes but i find that in the process of of getting the tail down i create enough waste so to speak that will oops and if this is recalcitrant when it comes to the dubbing, what you can do is you can, because these are long fibers, you can twist and then just wrap it all together like this. And then, of course, as all the bead flies, you want to have that space behind the bead properly filled. So when you think you've, you've gotten there, just pull any excess dubbing and make room here for a whip finish. Okay. If these are in the way, just cut them off. Okay. And then for the whip finish, just take your whip finisher, do one and do two. And that's it. That's the fly. And now the rest of it is, you know, vary the colors, vary the materials a little bit, vary the beads, and vary the hook size a little. And, and that's that. And this is going to get ragged in fishing, so I wouldn't worry about that too much. And that's the that's the fly. That's maybe even quicker and dirtier than Dave's Tom Thumb. <laughs> that requires a bit more skill. This one, a little bit less. If you can, if you can dub a little bit, um, you can certainly, you can certainly do this. So it's just a variation on this basic uh, micro leech concept, right? You do this. You do the same thing with, with marabou, right? You you take a marabou feather, you you put in a tail, then you wrap the rest of the marabou on the shank. And maybe you put a rib in there. All of this behind a behind a gold bead. That's you know, it's a basic idea, I guess. So you order your llama fur from the Canadian llama company. <laughs> I they I I looked on their website and they have some llama streamer hair dyed in a few enticing colors. And they when I ordered some materials from them. I think they sent me some of that llama uh, streamer hair um, as a sampler to uh, to entice me. Uh, hey Dave, maybe we could get some of that stuff. Do you know that that farm just near Elk Lake? Or yeah. Way on the right, <laughs> they have lots of llamas. Yes. <laughs> yeah. The um, I I discussed this this matter with my resident expert knitter, and. Uh, she said that the uh, 
what you find is typically alpaca yarn, not llama for some reason. I don't know why the the alpaca is the they're they're different. You know, we kind of think of them as all being llama, but there is alpaca, there is llama, and there is vicuña, and there are three there are three different uh, three different animals. And the one that yeah. you typically find uh, in uh, in yarn shops is the uh, is the alpaca. Sometimes in yarn shops you find uh, the fiber. They they would just sell you fiber like this by the gram. Um, yep. I suppose this is for people who want to do felting. They want to they want to spin yeah. their own yarn, right? So if you if you go to the source, you can get the stuff. Um, you know, the raw fiber, so to speak, uh, just kind of clean. And if, and, um, yeah. If you go out to the Saanich Fair, uh, they have a, the alpacas and llamas out there. And I think those guys, uh, you talk to them, they might be able to tell you that they have that available for people who do home spinning and knitting and stuff. Yeah. Otherwise, uh, you're in Victoria, you go to two places I would recommend. One is the Beehive downtown. Yeah, which you probably all know about. And the other one, there's a little shop. It, I don't know if it's still there, but I don't see why not. There's a little shop in in Fairfield. Um, there's a like a little there's a there's a grocery store there. And there is um, it's kind of pretty close to the border with Oak Bay. Um, and it's kind of in a stuck in a little corner, pretty close to the water. I can't remember the name of the shop, but I, I remember I found there, I have a little hank of kind of acid green dyed silk that just caught my eye. I think that's a pretty cool color. I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try some of these leeches in that, uh, in that color. Anyway, gents, I have to run, but thank you very much. This reminds me of a poem before you go, Tony by Robert Frost, who is a, a, a American poet. And it's about the lamb. He says, the one L lama, he's a priest. The two L lama, he's a beast. But I will bet my silk pajama, there isn't any three L lama. Of course, he was referring to a type of fire. <laughs> that was Robert Frost. Uh -huh. <laughs> well, if you have a good... Uh something that llamas like a lot you can just go up to a farm and uh, feed them and cut off a little bit of fur while you're at it so uh they're not very friendly animals i would be cautious with that <laughs> advice well, you have to do it across <laughs> they're the nasty fence. they're <laughs> nasty yes. and they i would be uh, careful mohammed i wouldn't <laughs> uh i'm not sure i would want to do as you say <laughs> well i'd have the fence between the llama and it, myself <laughs> uh, i see yeah I would so, see, see you later tony <laughs> okay, take care, Tony. Yeah, guess I can stop recording now. Here, yeah, you can stop recording. So we that was can, good, uh, gentlemen. Thank you. We can discuss the real secrets now. <laughs>